Well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Rudyard Griffiths, and uh, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to host this Rosenberg Research webcast with David Rosenberg, who you're seeing on your screens. Uh, David, uh, wave, wave to our viewers. There's David in his office, and our special guest, uh, Jeffrey Gunlack. Jeffrey, uh, say hello to everybody. Great hey guys. Terrific to have you uh, both here. This is going to be an hour long discussion. We're going to take uh, questions from you, the audience. So be sure to use the question feature in this webinar. Uh, the questions will come to me. After uh, Jeffrey, David, and I have kicked around a few issues, we're going to go to those questions and answer as many of them as we can. Just as a reminder, the host of today's webinar is Rosenberg Research, one of America's leading economic research and financial marketing strategy firms. It's led, as I mentioned, by the irrepressible David Rosenberg. He's a former chief North American economist at Merrill Lynch and chief economist and strategist at Bless You Chef previously. Our special guest, as you see on the screen, is none other than Jeffrey Gunlatch. Jeffrey is the founder of Double Line Capital and one of Wall Street's most storied and in my view, frank talking investors. I really always appreciate his frank analysis and insights. Uh, Double Tree is overseeing, uh, sorry, Double Line is overseeing some one, $141 billion in assets, uh, focusing on the worlds of fixed income, equities, corporate leverage, credit strategies. Jeffrey has a perspective on it all, and we're gonna get that uh, in the next uh, hour. So guys, look, I, I have to kick off with what's on everybody's minds, which is tomorrow's historic vote uh, in the United States, one of the most contentious and arguably one of the most important uh, elections, American elections of our lifetime. Jeffrey, let me begin with you. In, in 2016, you uh, went out on a limb and successfully predicted against uh, public opinion uh, that Donald Trump would indeed become president of the United States. So going into tomorrow, uh, a little over 24 hours away, what's your prediction on who will be the next president uh, come January 2021? Well, in 2016, I was certain that uh, Jeb Bush was not going to be the nominee because he was didn't even seem motivated. And uh, the people, he was the kind of the anointed one by the establishment. And when I knew that he wasn't going to win, I figured Trump was the best uh, odds to win the nomination. And I, and I came up with that prediction before the primaries even started, when Trump was like a one in a thousand sort of chance in the betting markets. And I knew that Hillary Clinton would be the Democratic nominee, and I was certain that she could not win. And so it's the weirdest thing to go to, to think Donald Trump would win when he was kind of a laughing stock. I mean, some people think he still is, but he was a laughing stock uh, as a not taken seriously as a candidate. Now, I, I think that this election, uh, and I uh, predicted in 2016, that if you thought that was a strange election, just wait till 2020. And I think I was right. I mean, with I predicted uh, unrest in, in major urban areas, and certainly we've had that. But I think that the election is going to go to Donald Trump again. Uh, I far less conviction than I did in 2016. When I was virtually certain of it. But I also think that whoever loses is going to throw a fit and contest the, the methods of voting in the election. I think it will be close enough that it can be, you know, litigated, if you will. And uh, I think that people will be kind of really unhappy on one side. And unfortunately, I can easily see demonstrations. I can see f further rioting and looting, particularly if Donald Trump wins. I, I don't think you have uh, Republicans historically have never really contested election in my lifetime. It's always been uh, the, when the popular vote for Al Gore and then for Hillary Clinton went to a Democrat, and yet the Republicans won the Electoral College. And that that's probably going to happen again, I think with Trump winning. I, I think that if Joe Biden wins, I suspect that he will not win the Senate. I think that there's a lot of people that will, will vote for Joe Biden simply because they think Donald Trump is a monster for what, whatever reason they feel that way. And they're just not voting, they're doing a, a protest vote. 
Uh, and I think when you look at the running mate, Kamala Harris, she was highly unsuccessful in the, in the primaries. She had no enthusiasm. Um, she dropped out without a delegate, I think, uh, even before the primaries really got going. And people, unlike Joe Biden, Kamala Harris tells you what she thinks, or at least what she proposes to do. And I think the fact that she couldn't even get 2% of the Democratic vote suggests that her policy positions are not terribly popular, certainly with the general electorate. They're not even popular with the Democrats. So I think a lot of people who vote for Joe Biden might hedge their bets and take and uh, deviate from history. Usually when a, the White House changes from party to party, uh, there's co what we call coattails down the ballot. So you get a bump in the Congress as well. I think, I think the opposite might happen if Biden wins, but I, I don't think he's going to win. I, um, I, really, I really believe that the polls have gotten far less accurate, intentionally far less accurate as the years have gone by. And the polls are being used as momentum builders and uh, uh, kind of uh, they're designed not to gauge opinion, but to guide opinion, I think. And therefore, I think that uh, I think that Trump will pull it out. Uh, particularly, I think I think he'll win uh, these Midwest states. One thing that I think a lot of people and there's two 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 points to this. First, I think Donald Trump will get historically high black vote uh, for a Republican candidate. Uh, the, everything seems to be trending in that direction. And I also think that the COVID lockdown is going to be a, a story post election. I think people are going to say, you know. One of the ways that Democrats win the Midwest and other parts and perhaps do well in Florida is you have massive universities, 100,000 students, you know, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and those go uh, very strongly Democratic and liberal. And I think with these universities having partial enrollment and social distancing and lockdown, I think you're going to have a narrative that develops post-election that what, we, what people didn't see coming that predicted a Biden win was that he was going to really underperform historical norms in these college towns where, you know, it's, it's like a party. They go to rallies, they vote together, yeah, and, yeah. Rah, 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 and they get hugely one-sided voting. And I think that's going to come in at a fraction of where it was. And when you think about the size of these universities and the states that they're in, I think there's, there's something there for Donald Trump. So the other thing about the election, is there's this bizarre narrative that uh, you know what you're getting with Joe Biden and, and Donald Trump is a loose cannon and you have no idea what kind of crazy things he's going to do. Well, that, that was a decent narrative about Trump in 2016, but it's a pretty lousy narrative four years later because the guy has, he, he, he exaggerates, he's got his own you know, style of persuasion, which is kind of unusual, but he has done pretty much consistent policymaking. He did do the tariffs. He didn't let up on them. He did move the embassy in Israel. He did do peace deals uh, with some of the Middle Eastern countries. We're not at nuclear war with, with North Korea. He cut taxes like he said he would. He cut regulations like he said he would. He seems to me like the, the, the non-volatile choice is actually Trump, whereas Biden won't tell you if he's for fracking, won't tell you what his position is on the Supreme Court or the filibuster or won't give you a, a names of, of, uh, of, of Supreme Court candidates, he would, he would consider none of it. Uh, and so I, I think he, he's just such an unknown that he's really the dangerous choice, particularly because Kamala Harris is likely to become president in the next four years if Joe Biden wins, because it just doesn't seem likely that he's gonna be able to, to make it four years. In fact, two thirds of Americans, even those that are pro-Biden, say they don't think he can make it four years. So mm -hmm. I think that, that, that the Kamala Harris piece, I think could ultimately be another deficit problem in vote count for Joe Biden. So I'm predicting a, a, a Trump win with a low degree of confidence, not like 2016. And I'm predicting that the Senate stays Republican with a, a reasonable degree of confidence. It's funny, today there was a story on Bloomberg, which I found fascinating. It was Joe Biden is warning Trump not to declare victory too early. That doesn't sound like a statement made by a confident 
politician with a comfortable lead in the polls. What's he, what's he so worried about if he believes those polls? So it's a very strange statement from the make, and I think it, it's a tell that their internal polling isn't, isn't quite close to the mainstream polls, which are used to influence rather than to gauge vote possibilities. Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, look, David, I got to come to you and get uh, your view, not just on who you think is going to win, but does this matter to the market, uh, David? The market seems to say, hey, look, either way, you know, there's a, a huge fiscal stimulus coming. It just depends if it's the Trump stimulus or the Biden stimulus. So should investors be concerned about the outcome or not? Well, look, I think from that perspective, uh, if uh, Jeffrey is right, and uh, Trump wins, uh, the Senate does not flip and it stays uh, Republican. Uh, the one thing we know with certainty is that the House is going to stay Democrat. Uh, that's almost ironclad. Uh, so what you're left with is what we've already been left with the past couple of months, uh, which is fiscal gridlock. Uh, so I think that, um, I mean, it's not even about Nancy Pelosi and uh, Steve Mnuchin. Uh, McConnell. McConnell will lead the Senate. McConnell already said uh, that even the two trillion, let alone the three and a half trillion that Pelosi first wanted, uh, what uh, all the Senate was willing to do under Mitch McConnell's leadership was 500 billion uh, fiscal policy light. Uh, that is not nearly enough to fill uh, the hole that's going to be coming from the loss of stimulus and whatever we're making up from reopenings or partial reopenings. It's just not enough. I don't think people recognize the mathematics that without the lagged impact of the stimulus that came into the system in late spring, early summer, uh, real GDP growth was not plus 33% in Q3, it was minus six uh, without the dramatic decline in the savings rate that got built up now that people could spend the money. It was you know, all about uh, the fiscal stimulus. Uh, today, we have a situation where I haven't seen the screen in a couple of minutes, but we had a uh, uh, a huge rally in the market, uh, and you could say, well, that's either a technical bounce back from being oversold last week, or the markets are thinking a blue wave. Uh, I'm sympathetic to what Jeffrey had to say on the politics. You know, then you go and you take a look at the market betting odds, and they're more like 65 cents to the dollar on Biden, and that's real money being put to use. Maybe it's a waste of money. Uh, I, I would tend to agree. You know, could it be could it be that the the pollsters are off by 10 points? Uh, they were off by three. I mean, Hillary, the, the lead she had in the polls was dissipating rapidly going into the November 2016 election in part because of uh, the Comey bombshell. Uh, it's hard to believe that, you know, that uh, Trump could win being down 10 points in the national polls, even when you account for the shying and I'm lying uh, aspect to it. But one, one thing we all know from the last election, from every election, is that it's about, uh, it's not about the national polls, it's how you're going to do uh, at the state level, that's all that matters. So I'd say this much, look, um, we will, uh, the one thing we will have early tomorrow is we'll have Florida. Florida has already started counting the mail-in ballots. Uh, they will be early with their results. I have to think that uh, if Trump doesn't take Florida, uh, I think he's in some serious trouble. He needs Florida. He needs Florida more than Biden does. Um, uh, but it's, I think, we're going to be very close. Uh, and the polls are showing that that race is really tightened up, as they have in a lot of the battleground states. But what I'll say is this much. Um, we get um, Trump in uh, with a uh, divided Congress. And what you see is what you get, which is uh, really nothing on the policy side at a time when we need coordinated policy intervention because uh, the pandemic's not going away and the effects on the economy are going away. Can you imagine what would have happened uh, if we didn't have the fiscal stimulus? The recession would be ongoing. Uh, we get hit with another second, third, fourth wave. I mean, old man winter hasn't even come yet. And we're starting to see an outbreak. We're seeing what's happening in Europe. We'll see what's happening in Europe. Maybe in Europe, maybe Europe's a litmus test. Maybe we'll find out that in this next wave of lockdowns in the UK, you know, they say that, well, we'll never have lockdowns. Well, Boris Johnson thought that too. Uh, UK, Germany, France, Austria, the Netherlands, Spain, but let's say they work. Let's say they work. We'll see. Uh, Israel locked down again, and it looks to have worked until it stops working. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I, we even saw this in, say, uh, in, 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 we could have a situation where it's not up to the federal government. There might be some regional partial lockdowns. 
if we don't have a federal response on fiscal stimulus because the states can't run deficits on an operational basis, it's going to be a very tough year for the economy. So the makeup, 100% right, you know, we're starting talking about who's going to win the election. Um, I think it'd be far better for the markets um, if we have a clean sweep. Either we have a red wave or a blue wave. I know people say a blue wave. How's that positive? Uh, I, I don't. I don't think, despite what they're saying on the campaign trail, tax hikes are not coming soon. Tax hikes are not coming soon. They'll come, but not soon. Okay. I don't think they're that crazy. They're going to start to raise taxes in this sort of environment, but maybe they'll come three, four years down the road. Income redistribution is part and parcel of the Democratic platform, but it's a question of timing. The one thing we do know is that Nancy Pelosi's three and a half trillion dollar package that was ready to go through the House to the Senate that's coming right away. Like you get a blue wave and that's what people are going to be saying, you know, tax hikes will come later. Okay. That we already know we've done the math. That's a 10% impact on corporate profits. Don't forget that that's corporate profits. You're going to amortize over 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, Cause you have to really capitalize that, that impact, but we're going to be getting tremendous, tremendous spending, uh, how it's financed probably on the central bank balance sheet. I'm sure that we'll have views on that. Uh, but make no mistake. Um, if you get, if you get a red wave, um, stuff will be happening uh, in, a, in a different way. Maybe it'll be more on the tax cut side, but we'll have more device, de decisive action. You get a blue wave. I'd say a blue wave is probably higher odds. Blue wave is probably higher odds because the House is staying Democrat. We're going to get tremendous stimulus. No, no matter what you think about stimulus, no matter what you think about it, it's going to drive aggregate demand. You drive aggregate demand, guess what? It's going to show up in profits before the tax increases do. And even somebody who's say, you know, not exactly positive on growth looking forward. I mean, this is an economy still on training wheels, but we've seen that the markets, the markets, we're calling the markets, the markets like training wheels. It doesn't matter how we're going to generate growth or profit growth. It's a matter of does it happen or not. And so I would say that the boost to spending that they're going to be doing across the broad front, the, the income transfer that will be ongoing to get people to spend is going to be incredible. And I'll tell you, if we don't, and I wouldn't mind getting Jeffrey's views on this actually, because the one thing people don't talk about is that without the stimulus, with the expiration of everything by the end of the year, we're going to hit into a huge eviction. You know, people wondering how do people right. stay yeah. afloat? Mortgage forbearance, you weren't allowed to evict anybody without without a coordinated fiscal effort, which we did have. There was a time actually in March, April, and May where we had a coordinated fiscal approach where the Democrats and the Republicans for a while actually got mm -hmm. along. Well, a, David, let's uh, let's go to Jeffrey and get uh, get his take on this because Jeffrey, I think people want to know how are you positioning uh, your investors at at Double Line coming out of uh, the, this election? Let's look at the next quarter. We we can talk about 2021 in a second, but I, I want to know it, more in the immediate context, Jeffrey, what your kind of outlook is, how investors should be thinking about the next. A uh, couple of months going into the the January uh, inauguration of either a new president or the official start of the second term of the Trump presidency. Well, I don't really operate with a three month horizon. I, I so I don't really have views so much on just a couple of months. But I think that we're in an environment where we're going to break away. We've already broken away, frankly, from a paradigm that we've been in that people have grown accustomed to for years and years, which was, you know, two and a half percent ish real GDP, inflation, very stable, uh, not much volatility. It's almost meta for the economy. It's almost metaphoric to what the stock market has done over the past three years. The year 2017 was the most sedate stock market of all time. There was the lowest volatility. The VIX index was living below 10 a lot of the time. And it was got, it got to be so consistent that a narrative developed that market had structurally changed and we would never see a high volatility again. There was a narrative that the VIX would never go over 15 again. When you hear the word never in the investment world, it means imminent. I was on CNBC in July of 2017. And when I was on TV, the, the VIX, craw the crawler showed the VIX at 9.85. And I was asked, what, uh, what uh, is your highest conviction idea? And I said, volatility is about to explode. And I said, the VIX will be above 15 before you know it. And when you go on TV and you say stuff that's frank and direct, subsequent guests go on and talk about how wrong you are and what an idiot you are. 
and all that stuff. So true to form, uh, a, a guest went on and said, Dunlock's an idiot. He doesn't understand that this market is structurally different. And she said, the VIX will never go above 15 again. It went above 15 the next day. And subsequent to that, <laughs> we had one of the biggest roller coaster rides in the equity markets that we've experienced in years. We've had a, a, a bear market uh, in, in 2018, fourth quarter. Then we rallied all the way back to a new high. Then we had a massive bear market this year. And then we rallied up in some cases to a new high. I think broadly speaking, macroeconomically, when I look forward a number of, uh, you know, for an investment horizon, I think we're gonna break away from this two, two and a half percent, we already have. I mean, we had a negative nine year over year real GDP. And now we've got, uh, Rosie is quite right about this consumer spending. It's been very strong at the low wage areas. Uh, the, uh, spending is up like six and a half percent year to date for low wage people. And it's down for higher wage people who are, seem to be saving. But I think that we're gonna move into an environment that has big fat tails to it. We've already seen that economically, and I think we're gonna see that from an inflation perspective. I don't know if we're going, I think right now we've had disinflationary forces, and I think we could certainly have a deflationary experience with all the debt that we have. That's a, always a distinct possibility. But we could also have, since the Fed has already violated the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, bro broken its charter, something they refused to do back during the global financial crisis, but this time they were so panicked that they did it, who knows what other rules they might break? What if the Fed reorganizes and just really truly starts monetizing, which might be tempting given that we have $157 trillion of unfunded liabilities, which is 750% of GDP, which obviously can't be paid back without three generations of nonstop depression uh, if, you, if you try to pay it back in today's dollars. So I think from an investment perspective, I hate uh, long-term bonds uh, at today's yield levels, but I still think you're supposed to own some because you could get a deflationary environment, which would you would need part of your portfolio to have that deflation hedge. As low as the 30-year yield is, about 1.6%, you could get a 30% capital gain on long-term treasuries. I don't like them. I think, I think that they've been selling off. Uh, rates have been rising in the last, uh, since August 6th, the rate of 200 basis points annualized, which would be a 35% total return negative uh, if, they if they rise that much in, in a year. But I think you're supposed to own some of them for the deflation case. And I also think you're supposed to own cash for the deflation case. And on the other side, I think you're supposed to own something that is an inflation hedge for the potential of monetization which if you're a Bitcoin aficionado, you could do that. I've been bullish on Bitcoin all year. I don't like Bitcoin. I don't invest in it. I really don't believe in it, but it's a great speculation vehicle for inflation or gold uh, for inflation. Because I think ultimately under that case, the dollar would really suffer. I think the dollar is gonna suffer in any case because the deficit is so very high at 16% or something like that of GDP. And when you get deficits exploding, it's not, uh, it's not, a, it's a headwind for the dollar for sure. And I think it leads with about two years. So this is not uh, advice for the next three months. It's more of advice for investment positioning. And I would kind of do these, these portfolio weights and then 25% in stocks, which would be also a way of protecting from inflation where, you know, you can always add a zero to the price of stocks. You can't add a zero to the yield on the 30 year treasury bond unless the rate rises first and, it, and then you buy it at, with the zero on it. Uh, so it's kind of like there was a mutual fund that was quite successful during global in the after the global financial crisis and then it kind of faded from view and it was called the permanent portfolio 25 percent gold 25 percent cash 25 percent government bonds long term 25 percent stocks i kind of think you're supposed to position for that as a fixed income investor we've been looking for the rates to rise from the very low levels they were got in the panic of the spring uh and they have risen, but I think the Fed will not let them rise. Uh, Jay Powell has been quite clear in plain English speaking to unlimited quantitative easing, which is what Rosie's talking about in terms of financing this huge stimulus. And Rosie's absolutely right, in my opinion, that without that stimulus, the economy would be in, it's, it's already in, in kind of tatters, but it would be a, a disaster. And, and of course, when you use such blunt instruments, like this money spray that went on earlier this year and, and the next stimulus package, 
it, the, the effects for the economy are incredibly uneven across income spectrums, across geographies. And, and I believe that not only the eviction problem that he's referencing, which is very real, I think there's a lot of problems that people don't understand that you have, first you have the big tremor, but then there's these aftershocks. I think there's gonna be some real employment problems uh, that will be born of the information that we've learned as CEOs about how your company operates through a different prism, the work from home prism gives you different insights. And I think most businesses will be downsizing in terms of middle management. I know I already have, um, because you just realize that some of these people that you think run a group, all they do is watch other people work and you don't need them. Yeah. And so I think that's going to be a drag. So yeah, I think the stimulus is, is, is absolutely going to be huge uh, if there's a blue wave and it's going to have uh, obviously a boost to short term in the economy. It also, not only does it help earnings as Rosie said, but there's clear evidence that some of the money that went out in the spring went into speculation. I mean, the number of, of uh, brokerage accounts at E-Trade and those types of retail outlets has simply exploded. And of course, Wall Street has been more than willing to create retail oriented products like all these micro minis and tiny option contracts. And so you've seen shattering, a shattering of any type of retail euphoria in those types of measures of sentiment, of uh, positioning, retail accounts, call versus put buying, which really has led to a, an extraordinary valuation uh, on the S&P 500, particularly if you think you get a blue wave and you would, now would have the PE of the S&P 500 pushing 30, which I know that, you know, it's a multi-year uh, earnings discounting uh, consideration, but 30 has not been historically a great entry point. No. David, let's hear your views on, on inflation because you're much more in the, the displacionary camp. You really have uh, ruled out, I enjoy your notes every morning, and a consistent theme of them has been your advice that uh, this concern about inflation is, is really white noise and uh, it's more the deflationary risk that investors should be focused on. Give us a bit more of your thinking there. Well, right. Well, look, you, you've had... Um... A, I would say a partial inflationary thrust uh, through commodities over the course of the past several months. Um, I don't find there's a big correlation between commodities and uh, final inflation, uh, but we've had some supply shortages. We've had some squeezes. Uh, we've had some supply constraints, especially in food. Um, but uh, I've never found commodities. Uh, I mean, if, if you're bullish on commodities, go buy basic material stocks. Uh, I wouldn't classify them as being necessarily a, a, a harbinger of uh, a future inflation. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult to get inflation without a wage cycle. And uh, we're gonna have just a mountain of unemployed. Uh, we have such tremendous idle capacity in the labor market and the best of the job news is behind us. We have a third of industrial capacity sitting idle. And this is, you know, with the best of the economic news really behind us, we probably have a few more months of the inventory rebuilding process as we saw with the ISM today ahead of us. But um, this is still a world uh, of, of deflationary pressure. And, and I would submit to people who are just going to look at fiscal policy uh, and uh, indebtedness as being a leading indicator for inflation, um, well, that, that hasn't worked too well in Europe, where they're stuck in basically zero inflation to deflation, or in Japan, which is the poster child. Um, you know, forecasting inflation, it's, it's very complicated. You're forecasting two very powerful curves, aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Uh, and I would make no bones about the fact that in the future, five, ten years from now, we're going to have a much more sclerotic what we say in economics, an elastic aggregate supply curve, because coming out of this crisis, it's clear to me that productivity is going to take a hit. The labor force participation rate is going to take a hit. Uh, we're going to find that those years where potential GDP growth was roughly 2 to 2.5% two might going forward be closer to 1%. Um, so it might not take that as long as it, I thought it might, if you're talking about years, uh, to finally close the output gap. Uh, maybe it won't be till 2030, but I think it'll be till 2025. I mean, just just look just look at the data. Look at the size of the hole uh, that we created. Uh, we're going to get tremendous stimulus if the Democrats win. Less so if the Republicans win. Uh, there'll be some stimulus. 
Uh, and I think that there'll be a day when inflation comes back. It's, I'm just saying it's so far out of my, 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 my radar screen. I mean, I, I agree with Jeffrey forecasting three months, that's noise, but I'm really going to go out. I mean, I do get people saying to me, what's life going to look like 10 years from now? And I can give a guess on that. Um, demographics, they say demographics is destiny. Uh, demographics uh, is something you can forecast 10 years out. Demographics in North America is certainly not inflationary. Uh, the move of the dependency ratio ongoingly is going to be disinflationary. I think the, the massive level of debt, now of course it comes down to how it gets financed. If, if we ever get a situation where we get the, the, the big bomb, which is debt monetization, and the Fed loses control of the monetary base, well, you know, that's something that I would have to, I'll, I'll wait for that to happen. I don't have to be ahead of that, ahead of that call. But, you know, when people talk about, you know, let's go back to the pre-COVID world. Let's go back to the pre-COVID world. Yeah, the pre-COVID world. What was that world of financial engineering? The biggest debt for equity swap of all time on corporate balance sheets. We had the, the stock market go up fivefold in the context of the weakest economic expansion in seven decades. I mean, we averaged barely more than two. Whether you look at Trump or you look at the last four years of Obama, a little over 2% in both cases. Weakest economic expansion. Uh, and we only, we only got to 3.5% unemployment because of courtesy of the declining labor force participation rate uh, among prime uh, adult workers. And yet with all that, with all that, with, with, with the massive, I mean, I mean, we went into this. It's, it's interesting because we talked about Donald Trump's promises, but Donald Trump also promised to balance the budget. <laughs> he did. And, and here in 2019, before the pandemic, yeah, he's the first Republican president to ever preside over a trillion dollar deficit. So we had the massive tax cuts, sandwiched that with the big Obama infrastructure package in 2009, tightest labor market since 1970, five times fold increase in the stock market. And inflation, the peak is two. And uh, what was the peak? The peak in the 10 year note yield happened early on in the cycle. The peak was two, so it was four. The peak was four. Going into the pandemic, we were at 1.9. Uh, the low for the cycle was 1.3, sandwiched in between uh, Brexit and the November 2016 election. Uh, so you got some very powerful uh, secular trends because a lot of people were saying all, all last time, look at QE, look at the money supply, look at all these things, and, uh, and we're going to get inflation. Uh, very clear that it's very difficult to create inflation in an environment of excessive aggregate debt, which is a tourniquet on aggregate demand, uh, and the aging demographics. Uh, and I think what's going to happen, and, and actually the San Fran Fed about six months ago published a report on the history of pandemics. Uh, and this one, look, I, I'm trying to figure this one out like everybody else is. I'm not an infectious disease specialist, so forgive me, but we can't seem to beat this thing, and we can't seem to beat it because it's so bloody infectious this is not sars we live with sars uh jeffrey's in buffalo mm. right now he's just across the lake you know i'm in toronto torontonians remember sars Rudyard, you remember sars but you yeah, see sars sure. sars was difficult to transmit and this is what happens is you lock down you, you know that's why the lockdowns don't make sense since you know you lock down and and it takes one person right and so this is so in uh it's so um easily to transmit i don't know how we're gonna you know how we're going to get out of this, uh, you know, is is is, a, is 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 difficult. I mean, barring a vaccine, which now seems to be put on hold, all this has impact on aggregate demand over the course of the next year. What I'm saying is that the inflation is going to come. I've written about this. It's going to come because the supply curve is going to become more sclerotic, and it won't take much in the way of demand. But if you want to talk about, you know, if you want to talk about dessert, when I'm still talking about the appetizers, we can talk about that, but it's more the time frame. For the time being, I, I am very much in the global deflationary camp. Uh, it's a, it's actually a very high conviction call. Yeah, and I think you're in the law of small numbers. I'm not, look, I'm not, I'm not bearish on long-term treasuries. And in fact, I'm not even looking at it anymore from a total return standpoint. I'm not looking at it, well, if you go up like a few basis points in a few weeks, this is what it does to the total return. If we go back down to the 0.54% lows that we had, uh, on the 10 year note, you're going to make this pile of money. I'm not talking about, I am not talking about owning treasuries, okay, uh, as a way to make a lot of money. I'm talking about it as a ballast in the portfolio, as a way to, to mitigate. Now, people are saying, well, look what happened recently. The bonds didn't rally with stocks going down. Yeah, but you didn't lose any money. That's what I'm talking about, like preservation, preservation of capital. Mm -hmm. 
is going to be very important. So sometimes it's just important when, you know, when, when, uh, when the tide goes out and things get rough, sometimes it's good to have something that just doesn't lose money. But Jeffrey will come back and probably say, well, I'll just rather be in cash than even take the duration risk. But you see, the thing is that I firmly believe that even for the people who are bearish on bonds, the way that they will be right is that we have to go back and retest the lows in yield. We naturally have to go back and retest. And if it's not a successful retest and we bounce off, we can safely say, okay, we're in a new second or bear market. We haven't even done that yet. But I'd say more to the point, what makes treasuries still valuable to me in a global context is their non-callable features. You know, you see, the thing is that you buy a stock, it's true. You add a zero, you know, stocks can make you a lot of money. Now, I'd rather buy the stock when the, when the CAPE well, where was the Cape in March? Like the Cape in March was what, like 20? Now it's 30? Like like the market itself, because of the growth stocks in particular, they're overvalued. How you want to value bonds? Okay, we can talk about that. But the thing about the bond market, think about long-dated treasuries, especially zeros when you think about it. What else on this earth do you know where you're going to get paid back in time X? You don't know. You can lose everything in the bond market. In the corporate bond, in the stock market, in the corporate bond market, well, it's all about default rates, recovery rates. But the thing is that we can talk about inflation as a technical default, but it's not really a default. Okay, you can inflate your way, you'll be sorry, your long duration, that much is true. But what makes treasuries so valuable in an uncertain world, and in fact, sure, they provide that, world, uh, is, is the certainty the certainty of payment, uh, and that's what makes it. That's Let's, what makes it different uh, from everything else, including gold, by the way. Yeah, let's jump in because that's where I want to go next. We're past the bottom of the hour. We're going to let you guys go at the top. You've been very generous with your time, but I want to get to our audience questions because they have come in hot and heavy over the last uh, period that we've been talking together. And the first one is about gold, uh, Jeffrey, and it's for you. What you know? What is your outlook uh, on gold? Uh, how does it feature into uh, your investment strategy? I uh, was quite positive on gold from the summer of 2018 into the summer of 2020. And I'm still believe that it's a good core holding for the long term, but I'm not, I haven't been very uh, interested in it uh, in, in recent months uh, as, the, as the dollar has bottomed out for the, for the, for the short term. I, like I said, I, I think gold is a good holding for part of your tail risk looking down the road. Uh, Rosie said, I would say just own cash instead of the bond. I actually said you should have 25% long-term government bonds as part of a long-term allocation. So, it, and, and I, for exactly the same reason that Rosie just articulated, I'm not saying you're going to make a pile of money. In fact, I think in the short, well, you have been losing money uh, recently on it, uh, but I think you're supposed to have that because that deflation risk is very real. But I think gold for the will uh, under the case that I think it has enough probability that it should be factored in, which is that monetization case. And Rosie's right, it's not gonna happen in the next three months. So you, you have time on this, but I, I think gold or something gold-like should be a significant portfolio holding um, uh, to, to hedge out that potential risk. And I think you'll probably be able to buy it a little lower than it is now, but that's just being cute. I, I, I think gold will probably go up very substantially looking forward a number of years. That was from Anthony Gorham. So Anthony, thank you for that question. And uh, I appreciate the uh, the brevity and the answer, gentlemen, because we've got a lot of questions to go through here. So let's try to knock some of them off. Uh, the next question is from Marius. He's asking, given the current uh, narrative in the equity markets with the Fed put stimulus driven liquidity and momentum, the speculative tone in Marcus's view, what if any, uh, I'll just read this properly. What, if any, does Jeff or Dave think uh, would matter most to the equity market uh, going forward? What, what Dave, in your view, could could upset the apple cart? We've been talking a lot about what could give this market a run over the next uh, year to 18 months in terms of uh, liquidity injections. But what, what would upset the apple cart, Dave, in your view? Well, do you mean upset the apple cart in terms of extending the bull market or in terms yeah, of reversing? Yeah, yeah. What's uh, what you know? What is the the wall of anxiety that this market could run into? Is it the virus? Well, is it the threat of course, lockdowns? Of uh, the what's virus. issue number one? The, well, it's, of course, it's the virus, and uh, it's the virus, and it's the if we don't have a uh, therapeutics or vaccines, and and we continue to extend 
Um, look, at, at the margin, people are behaving more cautiously. Now, when you stuff them with more money in their pocket, they'll spend part of that. Okay, we have the best of both possible, the best of both possible worlds in the past few months, where the government stuffed everybody with money. Okay, and the good chunk of that went into savings, and a chunk of that went into GDP, and we had the 33% quarter. So what's the risk? The risk is that the vaccine's not coming as quickly. Think about it. The vaccine's not coming as quickly, uh, and we're not getting enough stimulus. That's prescription for something called a double dip recession. Get a double dip recession, the stock market's going down at least 20%. Uh, and so that's what the risk is coming out of the politics. Uh, but if you're taking a look right now, um, the latest news on the vaccines isn't quite as optimistic as it was about a month ago. This is why the stimulus is so important, because it filters into aggregate demand, filters into profits. So we get a renewed profit recession uh, in that scenario. You know, what, what takes us to, to, to new highs going forward uh, is if, um, for whatever reason, we get the uh we get the democrats and the uh republicans working together uh on stimulus a big infrastructure package uh you know that that's going to help uh other spending um you know that's going to at the margin uh you know help prolong this period of economic growth the reason why the economy is slowing down so precipitously and why we could actually contract in the first quarter is because of the stimulus side i'm trying to actually make this point this is on a near-term basis an eviction crisis an eviction crisis and a for and the end of mortgage forbearance is going to be. I mean, you're going to see this start to play out in Jeffrey's world, which is called the credit markets. How credit markets behave in the next. You want to focus on the equity market. How the credit markets behave without stimulus is going to be very interesting. That's going to be a very, very big litmus test. So that's what takes the market down. Basically, is uh, the the virus doesn't go away. It doesn't look like it's going away. The vaccine is pushed out and there's no stimulus, that's prescription for uh, another leg down in the market. Uh, if none of that happens, and we get the, and even if that happens, even if we get a very rough winter on the virus side, if the government steps in again, I, I mean, look, we've seen the, the, the market is operating like Pavlov's dog. They are waiting for stimulus. So if we get a big stimulus package, uh, the market is at the minimum probably gonna hang in there. So that's what's hanging in the balance right now on the political yeah. side. Okay, let's hear uh, let's hear Jeffrey, Jeffrey on this because I Jeffrey, you know, you got to be talking to some interesting people about COVID. I mean, what are you hearing? I think we were all a little surprised here in Canada, frankly, at the speed of these European lockdowns. They seem, in, in a way, to have come out of nowhere in a matter of weeks. Yes. Uh, is there a material risk here that at a hundred thousand cases a day, significant uh, positive infection rates across the United States? that we could be looking at regional or statewide lockdowns in the U.S. Uh, yes. come the coming months. Yes, and, and I think this vaccine talk, which has been in the air for months now, is a pipe dream. There's never been a highly effective vaccine for any coronavirus. The flu vaccine that they've been giving for years often has failure rates in excess of 50%. 50, there was a survey, if there was a vaccine that the FDA proclaimed to be safe, and if it was free, and if it was readily available, would you take it? And the answer is 50%. So if you have a 50% failure rate and only 50% take the vaccine, you're only 70, you've got 75% of the population that's still vulnerable. So that's absolutely a major risk and the lockdowns very easily happen, uh, particularly if, if Biden wins. And then beyond that, I also think that there's this is a momentum market. This is one of the thinnest markets in the history of the United States, and it's driven by big tech. If the the S and P 490, if you take out the top the top 10, if you just look at the 490, it's not going anywhere. It's it's not it's not making progress. It's the it's the super six and regulation of the super six, particularly if you get a social unrest environment that really gets hostile towards the very wealthy with wealth inequality that would be that would be the, the that would be uh d highly destructive to the stock market because those are the names that are carrying the entire load and jeffrey you're suggesting to investors from what i've read recently that they should be looking outside of the united states for the next five years uh That's you right. think the next five years in the united states could be a really tough slog for people looking for return give us your case for going international and where would you go well, the United States stock market has outperformed the rest of the world by a monumental 
a degree over the last 10 years. And it, and really lately, it's just you know those, those 10 companies that are really doing it. I am very strongly convicted that the US dollar is going to go down on a, on a, a, a multi-year forward-looking time frame. And because of that, and because the US stock market has so grossly outperformed, by historical patterns, you would expect it to probably be about the worst performer when you get a true secular bear market. And with the dollar declining, that means that you're gonna do better in other economies. And so I think you're supposed to be looking at uh, really non-US markets. I like for the very long term, I like India because it's a massive reform candidate. The demographics are extremely favorable. And I think that there's parts when the dollar really starts to weaken, you're going to see emerging markets broadly outperforming. And so I think that's what you're supposed to do. I haven't recommended European investments for a long, long time because uh, you just you just have horrible demographics and the, the, the Eurozone is highly, highly vulnerable to further, uh, you know, uh, Brexit type of activity ultimately. And I, I think that, that, that it's just not very, very well run. So I think you have to look to Asia primarily. David, uh, you have a similar view, don't you? That uh, from reading your notes, uh, which I do regularly, um, you have some sense here that emerging markets, Asia, uh, that we're seeing some big, big shifts here in terms of where future capital flows are gonna go and where investors are gonna search for yield. Right. Well, look, emerging markets uh, are not a homogeneous uh, entity. So uh, I'm not talking about uh, Latin America, which would be part of a, a commodity cycle, more of a trade. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Jeffrey that, um, you know, I, I would say that uh, not just uh, India, um, uh, which screened actually very well in a lot of our global work, uh, we have actually been doing a lot of decade ahead, 10 year outlooks looking at uh, aggregate supply growth, potential GDP growth. Uh, India actually, despite their politics, um, as an obstacle screened very well, but guess what? So did China. Uh, people talk about uh, you know China's uh, demographics uh, being extremely challenged. Well, who doesn't know that? Um, but they have put so much money in the, in the infrastructure. Look, that's what I was saying. As corporate America was issuing debt to buy back stock, uh, and we went through the weakest uh, deepening of the U.S. real physical capital stock of any other decade in history. Um, China really ramped out their infrastructure. Uh, so their long-term productivity growth, when you when you tie in uh, their capital deepening, uh, is tremendous. Their, their, their infrastructure is the best in the world, in my opinion. And in fact, you can say that about a lot of Southeast Asia. But on top of that, who's come out of the coronavirus in the best shape? Uh, I mean, it's almost like it's perverse irony that China has emerged as a growth leader that, uh, uh, you know, but then again, look what they did in Wuhan. You can actually do that in a totalitarian state to do what actually they did. But the reality is that China did not blow its brains out on fiscal policy. <laughs> they did not blow their brains out on monetary policy. One of the few countries in the world that can actually cut interest rates. Um, their outlook actually economically is very good. And, and good luck to any White House. You see, this is the one thing, no matter who wins, China, if you think China was a big, political ongoing uh, political headline for the past decade, past two decades since they joined WTO, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet because we're 10 years away from China supplanting the US in PPP terms of being the largest economy in the world. That mm -hmm. is not good news for the West. Uh, how we, Jeffrey, you want to come in on that? Let's, uh, I think Jeffrey wants to come in. We can tell China's ambitions is going to be geopolitically very important, but I'd just say China and Southeast Asia are going to be high growth areas to invest in for the next decade. I wonder yeah, when for, people will start reevaluating their political philosophy, because here you here you have people uh, uh, strongly committed to the idea of democracy. At least the concept of democracy is what's drilled into your head in the United States. Is this is the greatest thing? And yet China has had massive economic growth with totalitarianism. They've got way better infrastructure than we do with totalitarianism. What are we doing running around talking about the, the great benefits of, of capitalism when we're, our outcomes are inferior? So you don't have to really worry, wonder about that. Is, is it possible that we could change in that regard? Yes, it is possible. I, I think we're gonna see very substantial changes 
and our political and cultural institutions in the next six years. Uh, because of the outcomes that we've, we've, we've developed, seem to not be satisfying people that greatly. Yeah, Jeffrey, I want to go a little bit deeper with you on that because you've, you've surmised that there really could be, in a sense, a revolution of sorts uh, in the works over the next five to 10 years in America. Can you paint us a picture of what that revolution would look like and, and when, when you could expect it to start to hit home? Well, I think you know, we're we're in the, the early innings of it. Uh, um, we have so much discord, and we've got a constitution that's really old in the United States, and it hasn't really been changed very much. The interpretation of it has become very important at the Supreme Court. But I just think that uh, the means of production, which change very rapidly with innovation, particularly the internet, social media, and the like, gets very out of sync at times with the property relations, how the benefits of society are split. And it seems to me to be very out of whack and getting more out of whack virtually every day. So that ultimately, I think that if we voted for the constitution today, I'm quite sure that part of the Bill of Rights would not be approved. And I think ultimately that something in that regard is going to happen. I, I believe it's quite plausible that the United States splits into more than one country. I think it's plausible because we have people that hate other people on the other side of the politics. And we have people that want to riot and loot in the streets. And we, are, we have people that want to get rid of the police. We have people that want uh, endless immigration and homelessness. And there's other people that have very opposing views. And the people that oppose those views they actually feel like, and I, have, I hear these conversations routinely, they feel like saying, look, if you want to do all those things, be my guest. I just don't want to be part of it, which sounds a lot like saying, go have your own, go have your safety zone, go have your, you know, your, your unpoliced community, go ahead, but I don't want to do that. And you're seeing it already happening through migration trends. There are triple the homes listed for sale in San Francisco right now than there were in the past five years. You cannot get a moving company. You cannot book a moving company to set up an appointment to move you out of Southern California. I know people that are trying to get out <laughs> and they can't find a mover because they're, wow. they're so far in the future. And these things are happening. They've already started. And so this, type, this has to be resolved. It, it, it can't just keep going. It's kind of like you've got one foot on the pier and one foot on the, in the rowboat and starting to split. And so you're, you're going to end up having to pick the pier or the rowboat, or you're going to end up in the water. And that's kind of where we are. Yeah, fascinating. A lot of this is becoming existential. David, I got a question from uh, one of uh, Rosenberg Research's uh, um, clients here asking uh, for retirees with you know bonds not providing uh, the traditional hedge against equity declines. Um, you know, where can a retiree go that's not cash what is your what is your advice and maybe just because we have talked about bonds a bit can we talk about either different equity classes or geographies that you think are interesting to that you know retirement style investor who's really concerned about the preservation of capital well look i think that uh well the thing about treasuries is that they are a perfect form uh of uh capital preservation uh, now, there's there's no doubt that if we get the big inflation, uh, you know, in, in, in real terms, uh, the value will erode. But the, the, I keep, come, keep on coming back to how, how could bonds, how could long bonds or zero coupon, um, where you know what you're getting, you know what you're getting from time A to time Z or Z, you know what you're getting. You don't know what you're getting in the stock market, okay? Uh, you're, you've got an asset that's inherently less volatile uh, and with perfect payment. Uh, I mean, how many other countries in the world right now have us? We have $16.5 trillion of bonds globally trading with a negative yield. The U.S. Treasury market isn't one of them. Now, if you're going to come to me and say, boy, should I buy a 30-year German bond with a negative yield? I'd say maybe not or a 10-year JGB at zero. Take a look at where these yields are around the world. 
So I would say that, um, uh, you know, that, that to, to say that treasuries, because people, you know, because again, greed takes over, you know, my bonds didn't make me enough money as the stock market, the Dow was down 10% from its hype. The bonds didn't make, no, but the bonds didn't really, you, you know, we're talking about when I looked at the data from, from when the stock market started to decline in early September, okay, okay, to the decimal place, the treasury markets lost you 1%. It's acted as a balance in the portfolio. Now, there's a, probably a lot of technical reasons why bond yields haven't come down doesn't mean that they won't come down but the bonds will act as a ballast in the portfolio and it's the certainty of payment okay and you will actually pick up some yield you buy a 30 year okay I, I misspoke when I said before about cash cash will just get you zero at least a long bond will get you one and a half percent but as as Jeffrey said in a deflationary world in a deflationary world which is a chance we'll go into a deflationary world, by the way, for the next several years. And next thing you know, you won't be able to buy that one and a half percent. And I can't begin to tell you, years ago, people were saying 3% on the long bond. What idiot? What idiot? I when are you going to pick up a three handle on the long bond again? You're going to have to wait a long time. So it's all basically, look, you could buy the stock market with a 30 multiple on the Cape. Okay. Uh, or you could buy one and a half percent long bonds. The thing about the long bond, look, there's always duration risk, inflation risk. If you're a portfolio manager, that much is true. If you're a retail investor, you just have to know this. There is no other security on the planet where your certainty of payment and guarantee is in the treasury market. That's what makes it unique and special. Uh, as, as much as I like gold, gold can go down and stay down. Okay, you don't have a guarantee of payment with gold or a gold certificate, okay, uh, or in the equity market. I could say, well, go into the dividend growth, dividend yields, dividend growth, stable balance sheet, so on and so forth, but it doesn't matter what equity you're going to buy. It's interesting that one of the worst performing sectors this year was one of the safest sectors, which is utilities. The reality is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Even if you're buying gold stocks as opposed to gold, or you're buying what you think is safe in utilities or residential REITs. Equity risk is equity risk. And what's what, that's what makes bonds valuable in your asset mix is treasuries do not have equity risk. That alone is why you should have it okay. in the portfolio. Just, I'm just conscious we're coming up to the top of the hour here. We're gonna let you, uh, both of you uh, go at 2 p.m. Eastern. And Jeffrey, maybe just to come back to you on that question, it's a simple one, but there's a lot of talk these days about really changing the asset allocation within portfolios fundamentally and and some people advising you know the old 60 40 you know ratio should be out the window you should be much more heavily weighted on stocks uh you know bonds are for something your grandparents used to buy what's what's your take on that well i echo what, what rosie said about the value of treasuries but when it comes to retail investors we're coming up to a time of year where opportunities often develop for retail investors in the closed end bond funds category. There's often year end selling and it creates bargains. What happens is closed end funds do not trade on net asset value. They trade on supply and demand. And when, when selling overwhelms the demand, you get very big discounts sometimes in closed end funds. And it often happens at year end because people do tax selling and tax and repositioning. You can't do this with big money because these, these uh, closed end funds are stocks and they don't trade with massive volume. So it doesn't work for a pension plan, but it's perfect for a retail investor. So you can, uh, you can invest in various sectors using closed end funds and get them at discounts. And they're, they're risky. Sometimes they have credit risk. Sometimes they're leveraged. That's one of the ways they earn their dividend payouts. But their closed end funds today, they're yielding eight and 9%. And if you can, if, the, if those get cheaper because of year end selling, they could go to yields of 10% with capital gain potential when that discount shrinks in. And I've, I've made a lot of money personally over, over decades using this strategy and it's getting to be that time of year where it can be beneficial. And yeah, it's got, it, got, it has equity ish risk because they do go down when the equity market drops just on fear, but they, they're, they're a good balance against the treasuries because they do have high single digit yields in some cases. Are there any Roger, funds you Roger, recommend, Roger, Roger, Jeffrey? One thing, Roger, I want to add one thing yeah. that I didn't mention. If we get, if we actually, if the Democrats win and we get the big stimulus, uh, you'll probably want to go long. I don't know, I want to hear what Jeffrey's got to say. I know we're at, at two o'clock, but 
I think Muni's would be a very attractive place to be. Uh, it's uneven in Muni's because I think you have some states that have some very serious problems, uh, like like Illinois, for example. But yes, uh, with that caveat, I, I don't see any problem with Muni's, particularly if the Democrats win. It just it seems right. like it would be a, a further value uh, value potential there. Okay, guys, I'm conscious we're uh, we're at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, wow, I've learned so much uh, this last uh, hour together. I think, uh, you know, if we could do this every day, I think we'd all be uh, better off for it. And then more importantly, in this moment where so much of the conversation is so polarized, uh, is so scatterbrained, you know, functions in the context of a 240-character tweet, it's just such a pleasure to spend an hour with two big minds like yours and have a civil and substantive uh, discussion on the important issues of the day. So it's a credit to you both, and I wanna thank you on behalf of the uh, Rosenberg Research community and uh, the clients of uh, Double Line that are joining uh, this uh, webinar also. So thanks a lot, guys. Let's see what this election brings. Uh, be safe, be well. I'm Rutger Griffiths, your moderator. I look forward to doing this again and continuing this conversation with you. Have a great rest of your afternoon.